behalf of the congregation, leading and shepherding to the point of exhaustion. Don't let anybody fool you. It's more than just getting you a cute message for 45 minutes on Sunday. There's a lot of work that goes into leading a group of people on a week to week basis. The work of caring for and leading a group of people can be the most emotionally, mentally, spiritually uh, exhausting thing that a human being could do. And you cannot do it outside of the power of God. Your pastor actually needs Jesus to lead you. And so it's a call whenever somebody uh, uh, answers the call to ministry to lead in a pastoral capacity. It is a call to true self-sacrifice. It is a call to lead by serving. It is a call to give his life on behalf of the sheep that is submitted under to his care. Well, what 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 does a pastor do besides read that little those little 66 books? Those 66 books. Get up there and tell some cute little Bible stories. The number one job of a pastor, don't ever get it twisted. The number one job of a pastor is not to cast vision. The number one job of a pastor is to preach and teach the word of God faithfully. His number one job, when he says, when when Jesus is talking about feed the sheep, what he's talking about is careful, faithful exposition in the word of God. That is the number one job of the shepherd. And now you don't think I just get up here and I, I make it up on Sunday morning, right? But do you know that sermon preparation for a pastor that really studies, that's one that's really serious about your growth and development, that sermon preparation typically takes up about 12 or 18 hours for one sermon. That's 12 or 18 hours of trying to figure out what God has said in a particular context at a particular time for particular people. And how does that coincide with what is happening in this local congregation? And so you got pastors out here uh, doing Greek and doing Hebrew and doing Aramaic, trying to figure out form criticism and literary criticism, all the things that you don't think about. Because when you come here on Sunday, you hear it and it's applicable to your life, but you don't see the work that goes in it from week to week. Preaching one sermon, one sermon is like 16 hours of work by itself. We were doing an outreach Last Saturday, um, and I was stopped at the station. We was working, two young ladies in the church who served here, and one of them was like, whew, Pastor, I, I don't know how you do that every week. That, that's absolutely crazy for you to do that. Every, that, that. That feels like it's a lot. I have no idea how you do that every week. One other young lady, I love her comment. She said, Pastor, I just be chilling out on Saturdays. I just be riding my car, just having a good time. And I be thinking, oh, you know what? My pastor is at home. My pastor is at home while I'm out living my best life. That, that is the sacrifice that God calls a shepherd to, to give up something for the, on the behalf of his people. He is called to pray for his people constantly. You don't see him when he's at home pacing the floor, calling out your name on your behalf. You, you don't see that. You don't, you don't know that it's not his job to come and tell you that he's been calling out your name, your family's name, your spouse's name in prayer. You don't know what it's like to try to lead a team of mostly volunteers, the people that you don't pay, to get them all going in the same direction to accomplish the same mission. Do, do you know how hard that is for people who say that they love Jesus to only see them maybe one Sunday out of an entire month? And you do all of the labor on their behalf to to speak into their life and they don't appreciate it. Your your local pastor, not the one you follow on social media, not the one that you like all his videos or you listen to his podcast. He's not the one that's going to do your wedding, your funeral, pray for you when you're sick, come to the hospital when you have a baby, be there for you when you break up with your loved one. He's not going to be there for that. But the local pastor is. And this is a sacrifice that the pastor makes, giving you advice that you're never going to listen to. You need to break up and you're with him six months later. And he has to still tell you because he's a shepherd and he cares for you, knowing that you're not going to listen. This is the work of a shepherd to come alongside you and bring correction in your life when he sees you veering off course, knowing that you're going to be mad about it, dealing with disgruntled people, upset people, angry people, trying to make decisions on behalf of all, knowing that most ain't gonna, on, are not going to agree with it. Th- this is the burden that they carry on a week-to-week basis, bringing doctrinal correction, bringing character correction to people's lives. And so when he does this and he's trying to preach the gospel on your behalf for the glory of God, don't you think if you deal dealing with spiritual warfare in your life, What is his like? Are you praying for your pastor? 
When's the last time you prayed? Did you ever just stop on Saturday and think, you know what? I'm going to church tomorrow. And I pray that God uses the pastor to speak something in my life. I'm not condemning you. I'm just trying to paint a picture and give you some reality. When, when Paul writes the letter to Timothy, he says, hey, 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 Timothy, make sure that, that, that those, the elders who lead good, who rule well, count them worthy of double honor. Not, not regular, but double honor. Count them with, with double honor because of the hard work of preaching and teaching. And so in an age of ultimate disrespect of anybody of authority that you don't agree with, Scripture calls the church to respond to them very highly, not in bitterness, not in resentment, not in anger, but in love. But in love. And the Bible calls the church to respond to the leaders in a way that is rooted in love. It's not a call to worship a pastor or a spiritual leader, but it's a cause to pause for a moment and look past your own preferences, complaints, and issues and say, you know what? I don't know for certain what my life would be or where I would be in my walk with God if he didn't speak the word of God into my life week after week after week. God, I'm sorry for taking that, uh, taking advantage of that and not considering that, but Lord, thank you that I have a leader that cares enough for my soul to speak the word of God to me every single week. So let me give heed to what they're saying. Let me not keep taking everything they say to me like a suggestion. But let me respond in a way that God will call me to respond. Paul gives this to the church, not as a suggestion, but as a command. The writer of Hebrews said it like this in Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. When he says to keep watch over your souls, that word literally means to stay awake at night. That he can't even sleep because he's so concerned about your life. The pastor, preacher, the local guy has to give an account over your soul. Not your mama. Not your spouse, but he says to the pastor, he will have to give an account for your soul. This is why you submit to leadership and their decisions if it, ha it has nothing to do with your feelings, but everything to do with Christ and what he requires of those that are assigned to lead you. The church should strive to make them le make leading a joy and not a cause of pain and sadness. What does that mean I should do? That means that I should submit and support. Submit and support. Support their decisions. If you trust them to preach God's word over your, over your life week to week and lead you in spiritual formation, but when they make a decision you don't like, you throw a temper tantrum. Ooh, say amen, somebody. If that is your response, it's not the work of God. It's actually the work of Satan. If Jesus willingly submitted to the authority of his father, what makes you think you don't have to submit to the local authority that he put over your life? He says it is unprofitable for you to refuse the message and the ministry is not to refuse the minister, but to refuse God himself who is speaking and working through that minister. Let me say this as a point of love and not anything else. Hear this in love, please, church. Those, those of you that are, that are watching that go to a local church elsewhere, he, hear this. If you don't respect the authority in the local church and you can't bring yourself to honor them, do yourself in the church a favor and go where you can respect the leadership and the authority. I say that in all love. If you feel like you, I, I just can't, I can't trust them. Well, then go somewhere where you can trust them. Here's why. Because it doesn't benefit your soul to sit in bitterness week after week. You think you hurting them. But that's you drinking poison and expecting everybody else to get sick. Well, I'm going to just sit here with my arms folded. And the only person you're hurting is your own soul. That's, this is why it is so important. But for those that I've seen personally that have submitted, that, that even sometimes when they, when they, they don't want to be stretched, when they don't want to be pulled, there are people who came to this church that came for one reason and God has opened a world of ministry to them. They're doing things that they never thought that they would be able to do. They're expanding upon a capacity that they never thought that they had. They're growing in the faith because instead of complaining, they submitted. 
It is a hindrance to your growth when everything is a questionable thing for you. Respect them, love them, pray for them, support them. Respect them, love them, pray for them, support them. Respect them, love them, pray for them, support them. And then what he says is this, be at peace among yourselves. That actually helps the leader of the church when, when the congregation is at peace. When the, when the believers are at peace among themselves, there are less disputes for him to step in to settle. Less dissension in the church to deal with. You, do you know that peace, that peace should not be uncommon with members in the church towards their leader and each other because peace is a fruit of the spirit that we should all have. Where, where there is an absence of peace, there is a neglect of the Holy Spirit. That, that's not just in the church, that's in your personal life. Where there is an absence of peace, there's a neglect of the Holy Spirit. When you are mindful of the Holy Spirit, you work towards peace. As soon as when someone comes and you have an inclination that they're planting seeds of discord, dissension, and division, you either bring correction to it or you detach from them. Do you know that in your New Testament, Paul commands in several scriptures in the New Testament that when it comes to divisive people, he doesn't even, he don't have no trial, he don't have no meeting. He said, get rid of the person who don't have nothing to do with them. That's in your Bible. Literally, he says, get rid of them. That's how serious the peace and purity of the church is. It takes the whole body working together to bring, to, to bring true peace to any congregation. That is how you respond to the leader. But then he gives instructions in verses 14 through 15 on how the church members are to respond to each other. How they respond to each other. Look at verses 14 through 15. He says this, and we exhort you, brothers and sisters, Warn those who are idle, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone, see to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. The task of maintaining the well-being and the health of the church is not the sole responsibility of the pastor. It is not his job to be the local referee. That that's not his job. The members of the congregation have a mutual responsibility to look to, to take care of each other and to build each other up. Here's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter four. The apostle Paul said this in Ephesians four, verses 11 through 13. And he gave he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. This is what he gives to the church. And here's what their job is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. Why? To build up the body of Christ until when? Until we all reach the, in the unity, in the faith, in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. The church has a responsibility to each other to come alongside each other and to help in their spiritual growth. The pastor trains them, equips them through teaching and preaching the word of God, and then they disciple one another. And so here's what he says. Um, for all those people that sit among you week to week and they don't really do anything, they just watch everybody else do, anything, do everything, they don't contribute in any shape, form, or fashion, he says warn those who are idle, the, the undisciplined, the, those that, that don't live up to their responsibility as church members, those that don't contribute to the work of the local church, the, those that are takers but refuse to contribute to the work, the, those that watch everybody else do all of the work in the ministry. Th those that watch everybody else show up early and show up on time to do all the work. He says, warn those that are idle. W warn them, warn them that, that God didn't call them to idleness, but God actually called them to get in the game and do something and contribute to the work of ministry. Th that, that warn them that if you see a brother or a sister that's not carrying their weight, that you come alongside them and, and warn them that God didn't call us to this because at some point, if you've been here five years and you've never served, I'm starting to question whether you're a believer or not. Because if God calls you, there's no way that you don't flesh something out. Comfort the discouraged. And I think I want to pause here. Comfort the discouraged. This is important because in this particular context, People are dealing with suffering and persecution. It's heavy in this church. It's heavy. Just like now, so many people who are discouraged, struggling in their faith. He says, comfort those that are discouraged. You who are strong, come along. Hey, 
you look like you're about to give up. Hey, I don't know what's going on with your life, but I just came here to walk, walk alongside you. You know what that means? That, that actually means that you actually care about somebody else. That you are aware enough and alert enough to observe somebody else's life. Not be in their business, but observe their character, observe their life, observe their struggle, see something. And say, hey man, you look sad the last two weeks. I don't know what's going on. You don't, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. But bro, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. Matter of fact, you, you want to pray right now? Hey sis, I see, man, you, you look like you worn down. You, you look like this relationship is tearing you up. You, you look like you, you burdened. You look like you heavy. You know what? I, I want to come alongside you. And I, I just want to, I want to help you out. Can, can, you mind praying on me for a second? Matter of fact, tomorrow I'm going to text you. Yeah, yeah, I know you might ignore my text. I, I know you keep avoiding me. I, I know you ain't been to church in three or four weeks because y'all just broke up. I, I know. But I want to let you know that I'm praying for you. Comfort those who are on the verge of giving up. He says, help those who are weak. Help those that are struggling. Help those that are struggling in the faith. Help those that are genuinely struggling with sin. That sin is overtaking their lives and they are stuck. They can't find their way out. He says, come alongside them. Lay a hold of them. Help those who are weak. Pray for those. Speak the word of God into their lives. You know what I thought about? You can't really, the best thing you can actually do for another believer is speak the word of God to their lives. But how can you do that when you yourself don't know God's word? The best you can say is, it's going to be all right. Why? Girl, don't give up. Why? Bro, keep going. For what? I've been going. But, but you can speak God's word into their life. That is life giving. That's really the power of life and death is in the tongue right there. Not you speaking life or speaking, I declare and decree that you're going to have a car by next time. No. You're not going to have a car by next summer if you don't work hard and save up and get good credit. Somebody say amen. amen. He says, come alongside people, even if they refuse it at first. And then I love what he says, be patient with everyone. Do you know that patience is a fruit of the spirit? Here's why this is wise. When you bring people from all walks of life and you put them in one community together, there's bound to be annoyance and frustration and irritation and agitation and every kind of other Asian. Because we're all different. We all got different vantage points. We all see, see things completely different. And so when you have that and you're working toward a common goal, you need patience for everybody. You, you, you must exercise patience. But you know what helps with patience? When you actually get to know somebody. So... Final thing he says about the church is, see to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Some believe Paul is talking about the enemies, those who were persecuting those that were outside of the church, the people that were outside of the church that were persecuting the believers in Thessalonica. He, I, I, I agree with that, but I also think he's talking about those within the church, those within the church, those that, that, that were in the body of Christ, and he's telling them, hey, if somebody in the church does something to you, your responsibility is not to respond in kind and pay back evil for evil. Matter of fact, the blessing comes when you don't return evil for evil, but you do good to those who insult you. Every time somebody insults you does not give you license to insult them back. The, the best thing that you can do for a person is actually do good to those who persecute you. And if you can't do that, then the ignore and delete is your best response. Either you do good to them, but if you ain't not saved, <laughs> ignore and delete. Y'all got that? But you don't get back into a tit for tat for them because that doesn't honor Christ. The, the blessing comes. He says, literally, he talks to Peter was talking about uh, uh, insulting people. He says, don't insult them, because when you don't insult them, you actually inherit a blessing. And some of us have been undermining and undercutting the blessing that God wants to bring into our lives because we've been going back and forth with foolishness with people in the church and people in our families. And God says, stop doing that. Say something good to them or don't say anything at all. But don't short circuit what I want to do in your life because somebody else has pulled you down in their slop. 
You don't have to respond to everything. You don't. But he says, strive to do good towards everyone. Those inside and outside of the church. Then he talks about the most important thing was how we respond to God in worship. Would you look at verses 16 through 22? This is beautiful. Here's what he says. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything. I want you to underline this if you're taking notes. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Notice this is not the first time that he talks about God's will for the people of God. Chapter 4, if you remember, he said your sanctification is God's will for your life. Here he says God's will for your life is to rejoice always, to pray constantly, to give thanks in everything. That's actually God's will for your life. Then he goes on to say don't stifle the spirit, don't despise prophecies, but test all things, hold on to what is good, stay away from evil. And so I want to focus on these three things right here. Rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks. Rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks. Here's the thing you need to know about Christian joy that it doesn't ignore the reality that there will be sadness and grief in this life. It doesn't ignore this. But what it's saying is, if I have the Holy Spirit, I can have joy in spite of those things. I don't have joy because I'm suffering. I have joy in spite of my suffering. That even if I'm going through a, a difficult road, I'm going through a difficult time, I am struggling in my faith because I have the Holy Spirit, I can still have joy. And this joy that I have is not rooted in me just trying to make myself happy. This joy is actually rooted in the gospel. As we grow in our relationship with God, we should grow in joy. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Matter of fact, it is a gift from God. And who are you and I to reject the gift that God gives us, the joy of joy? But how many, how come it's so many Christians right now that are walking around in overwhelming sadness and not experiencing any joy? I'm starting to question, do you really know that you have the Holy Spirit? Is he really living on the inside of you? I'm not saying you have a bad week, a bad day, a bad month, but I am saying that at some point joy should be your portion because it is a gift from God that you should not reject. And at the same time, if things are going bad, no matter what you lose around you, you should rejoice in the God of your salvation. I will celebrate the Lord and his salvation will be my joy. I am rejoicing because I don't have stuff, but I got the most important thing. I got God. I got God so I can have joy. And he calls them to rejoice. But you know what else retire, are tied to rejoicing? Praying. Prayer is directly tied to joy, and a robust, fluid prayer life can infuse our souls with joy. Prayer is more than the movement of our lips, but it's actually the elevation of our hearts towards God. It means nothing if you're just moving your lips, but you ain't elevated your, your heart towards God in prayer. That that prayer is more than just words you say. It is an encounter with God, that, that we give God our hearts. This is not just good for the individual. This is good corporately. The way of progress in the church is through prayer. And if the church is not praying, the church is a lifeless and hollow institution apart from the saints praying that God would meet us and what he called us to will be accomplished in the world. But only as we pray. Only as we pray. But you know what else is tied to rejoicing? Thanksgiving. He calls us to be thankful. And just like joy, ultimately, our thanksgiving is rooted in the gospel. It must be rooted in what God has already done for us. If we don't grasp this, then our whole life will be one of frustration. But God called us and God has saved us when we didn't deserve saving. And so that means that we can be thankful at all times because of what God has done for us, not because of what we deserve, but because of God's unmerited favor in our lives for saving us, that God initiated our salvation, that yet while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That is always a reason for us to pause and give thanks to the God that saved us. When we know that Romans 8, 28 is real for all of our lives, that no matter how bad the situation, that 
all things can work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I can thank God even in the midst of sadness. I can say, Lord, I didn't foresee this coming. Lord, I don't like what happened. Lord, I don't like where I am. But God, I thank you for saving me anyway. None of this rejoicing, praying or thanksgiving has anything to do with your feelings, but everything to do with your spiritual reality. And so this is God's will for you. Have you ever thought that joy is God's will for your life? Have you ever thought about that? I know you think this job, this degree, this move to this relocation, this marriage, this thing, thing, this money, this right, right, this thing, thing that's God's will for your life. But what if God says rejoicing is will for your life? That being thankful, to rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. What if that is God's will for your life? None of this can happen apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, verses 19 through 22, don't stifle the Spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. I'm not going to get into this too deep, but he talks about not despising prophecies. Now, some of us of the charismatic persuasion love a good word from the Lord. Some of us of more the conservative reform persuasion believe that the prophecy has ceased in the New Testament and the close of the canon. But without revealing my hand and where I stand on this position, what I am going to say to you is this that we can't deny the Spirit's activity among us. That there should be, some, should be some sort of supernatural occurrences that happen among us at some point. That we can't just be the chosen, fro the frozen chosen. That we can't just sit here, but that the Spirit has to move at some point on our behalf and in our midst. That at some point, people should actually come to church and feel something. I'm not saying that your feelings mean everything, but I am saying if you're in a relationship with God and the Spirit is working in your life, the same way I can jump and touch my ceiling last night because of the football game, I should be able to have some sort of emotional response to the God, to the God that hung on the cross and hung in there and died for my sins. That, that there should be some sort of uh, evidence of the Spirit's activity among us. Now, this is to say this. If somebody, a sister in the church, brother in the church, comes alongside you and say, hey, I got a word. Ah. Ah, you got a word? Ah. Ah. Ah, you got a word for me? Oh, man. You sure it's not something you ate last night? Don't immediately reject it. Now, this is not licensed to all you parking lot prophets. It is to say that if somebody says, hey, bro, I don't know, man, I, I just been thinking about you, been praying for you, and I just, I just have a strong impression to let you know that all things are going to work together for your good. That, that it, bro, I, I, I just want to remind you that, that that you can rejoice in the Lord. I, I, bro, I just, sis, you look heavy. I just, spirit is, hey, you know what? I've been looking at God's word and, and I'm not trying, I'm not in your business. I'm not, I'm not trying to Im impose myself on you. I, I'm not, but I, I just don't think that what, that where you are, I don't think that's God's best for you. Here's why, here's, here's what it says in his word. You don't reject that. You receive that. You hold on to that because it's for your edification. Now, they come to you, they come to you and oh, God told me to tell you that. Oh, my, 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 my. And God told me he showed you, he showed me your husband. Hmm? He showed you, he showed me. A bro, she walk up to you and say, God told me, man of God, that you you supposed to be my husband. Mm -mm. No, nah, sis. No, nah, sis, that ain't it. God told me to tell you about to get a job promotion. Did God tell you that they late every day? Oh, that book is in your future. You're you going to be a best-selling author. Do you know that they don't even read? They don't own no books. You prophesying books, book deals. God tell me your CD gonna go double platinum. Do you know that they can't sing? 
and you feed into people's inclinations and their desires. Talking about you got a word from the Lord. Reject that. But don't despise it when it is good. And so you put all of this stuff together that it gives us. You put all of this stuff together to warn those that are idle, to, to comfort the discouraged, to help the weak, to do all of those things, to be patient with everyone, to rejoice, to give thanks, to pray. All of those things together, it seems like a lot to do. It seems like a lot and it seems impossible for a person and it seems impossible for a church. But I love this. I love it so much because Paul ends this letter with a beautiful prayer, what I believe is one of the greatest prayers in the New Testament if not the greatest prayer, here's what he says to them in verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole life be put together. Your spirit, your soul, and your body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, it is so beautiful. He who calls you is faithful and he will do it. He will will do it. Paul knows that of, out of all the things that, he been, that he's been telling us to do and that he's instructing them to do, he knows it is a lot. He knows that it's impossible. Paul actually tells us to do something that is virtually impossible for a person or for, or for a church to do. But that is the beauty of it. That is the beauty of it because God leaves us to struggle with holiness so that we will learn and make a habit of coming to him for the grace to do it. Your struggle, our struggle, is just an invitation for us to acknowledge and admit and realize, I can't do this on my own. I need God's help to do this. That is the beauty of the gospel. He prays a big prayer that God would make us whole, that, 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 that your sanctification is a comprehensive Intensive work of God, that there is not one part of your life that God doesn't want to make whole. That's beautiful. That God doesn't just care about your relationship, that God doesn't just care about your finances, that God doesn't just care about your job, that God doesn't just care about your family, but God cares enough about your whole life that he wants to make you completely sanctified. That he wants to touch every single area of your life. He says, may the God of peace do this. And I'm done. May the God of peace do this. I want to let you know this. That peace is virtually impossible if we don't pursue holiness. Some of us are absent of peace. Because we have not pursued God. Peace and holiness are inseparable. I just want peace. You should want to pursue God as much as you want peace. I'm just not at peace. I'm not at peace in my head. I'm not at peace in my heart. I'm not at peace in my life. My question to you, if you're not at peace, are you pursuing holiness? And when I say holiness, I don't mean a long dress down to your ankle bones. I don't mean a hat. I don't mean sitting in the amen corner. I don't mean saying a long two-hour prayer. I don't mean wearing white gloves in the church. I don't mean a choir robe. But when I say holiness, I mean pursuing a life that is trying to be more Christ-like. Peace and holiness is inseparable. You can't have one without the other. And many of us are weighed down by life because we're trying to figure out what's wrong and not pursue God. We're trying to change jobs, trying to save more money, trying to figure out who to date, keep praying about God sent somebody in my life. And I'm not knocking all those things. But what I am saying is that the pursuit of God is more important. That if God wants you to be whole, that God wants to get your whole life together. 
then he's not leaving it to you. That he'll be the one to do it. That, that the gospel makes up for our shortcomings. The gospel is not just good news. It's the best news. It is the best news because in our frailty, in our weakness, in our sins, while we were there, God sent his son to die for those same sins that he took, took all of our crap. He took it on, on the cross, stood in our place. Died. God received it because God raised him from the grave. And because of that, we are forgiving, giving, but not just forgiving. He didn't just make us neutral. He didn't, he didn't just make us regular. He gave us his righteousness. He that knew no sin became sin so that we could be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What do I do with that? I respond to it. I fall into it. I surrender to it. God, if your desire is to make me whole and, and you will do it, then God, my life is yours. Take this relationship. Take, take these finances. I suck at managing them anyway. God, you know I don't tithe anyway. Take these finances. God, I've been on a struggle bus of relationships for a long time. I'm not good at it. Take it. God, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm tired of trying to corp, corp, corporate ladder. God, I'm trying to, tired of trying to plan out my whole life with what I want. I'm tired of hitting my head against the ceiling. God, I surrender to your will. That if you call me to do all of these things, then I surrender today. I'm yours. And God, if you've called me, if you've called us, then God, you'll be the one to do it. He will do it. Take the heavy burden off your shoulders and cast your cares on him. Let the gospel free you from performance, from perfection, from works, from trying harder. Live in the grace of God. Live in that grace. Because he will do it. He that began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He'll do it. Let us pray. Faithful God, thank you. Thank you, faithful God. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for your spirit. That at times it convicts, but other times it encourages. Lord, thank you for desiring to make us whole. Let us live in that reality. Father, for those of us that have been idle, those that are weak, help us, strengthen us with the strength that God provides. Lord, as a church, help us to strive in gospel centrality, that, that Christ is our focus. Help us to love our leader. Help us to love each other. And God, help us to love you. And so, Father, today, today I just pray that you do the work of grace in our hearts, that you radically change us. Lord, let us not just see this as a sermon, but let us see this as God speaking directly to us. And so, Father, bring these things to our memory when we are tempted to neglect it and forget it. And so, Father, we thank you, we praise you, we bless you, and we pray this prayer in your son Jesus' name.
And the people of God said, Amen. Would you put your hands together for Jesus on today? Amen. Amen. Hey, I pray that you were blessed by the message that you just watched. Hey, the gospel always calls for response. And one of the ways that the gospel calls for us to respond is through our giving. God gave extravagantly to his people by giving his son. And so we give financially. We give not to get something from God, but we give as a response to what God has already given us, which was life through his son. Hey, why don't you consider partnering with us financially by giving to the work of ministry. Hey, we do so much in our community to be a blessing to those around us. We're not here in the business of taking, but we're in the business of giving what's been given to us. And so, hey, why don't you go on our website, outpouringorlando.com, click on the donate tab, and you can give to the work of the ministry that is being done through the outpouring. Hey, once again, I pray that you've been blessed, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.